So if you're not there yet, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to be looking down to verse 5. Many of you know this letter as Paul's farewell address to his spiritual son, his protege, Timothy. And these are his parting words. Young Timothy was an elder and he was a young man. And you can think of this like wise old words from a dearly old and seasoned saint. Look at what Tim, Paul says to Timothy. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 4. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of His appearing in His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And you may be thinking, because Brother Aaron has already said that I'm doing a lecture on Charles Spurgeon. What does this text have to do with Charles Spurgeon? And I would submit to you that his life and ministry was defined by this text and text like this one. Many of you know Spurgeon. If I had a raising of hands, I bet you everybody in here would raise your hand. And if you didn't, we wouldn't judge you. But after this, uh, we would say you are no longer with excuse. You know who Brother Spurgeon is. <coughs> and... To give you a little bit of background, when I was an MDF student, I had just gotten done with music school. I did my bachelor's in music, and through God's kind providence, I entered into seminary and was confirmed by a church to go into ministry, so I entered into a seminary in Texas. And while I was there working on my Master of Divinity degree, I, <coughs> I met this young man named Taylor. And Taylor was a freshman at the college. So think of it like five years apart. And we met one another at this seminary in college. And we became friends through talking about doctrine and all that good stuff. And he said you should go out and do evangelism with me. And I said, no, I can't do that. I'm in a wheelchair. You'd have to push me around everywhere. And he's like, I don't care. You're coming with me. That was the essence of that. And so little did I know evangelism meant him putting a mic up to my face and having me open there preaching. So... He's probably going to hear this lecture if it's being recorded, so I don't mind all this being out in the open. But I was absolutely scared to death it was at a Cowboys game. And I had already done pulpit preaching at that point. And pulpit preaching is very different. One of the reasons why, just like you guys, you want to listen to me. Or at least I hope you do. Right? And so, you, you want to listen to me. You're rooting for me to do well. Or at least I hope you are. So, you, you're here because you want to be here. 
But oftentimes, when you are, are doing street evangelism, the people would rather a meteor fall from the sky and land on your head, a lot like the wi Wizard of Oz with the Wicked Witch. <laughs> so with, with that said, dear friends, I got <coughs> into evangelism, and particularly street evangelism, through this young brother who is now pastoring up in upstate New York and doing great things up there. And this dear brother uh, got me involved with evangelism. And something that I began to realize is that my evangelism was making my pulpit ministry better. And I think vice versa. If you're a pulpit preacher and you spend a lot of time in the scriptures, it's going to help you go out and evangelize when you actually get to do that. And when you're sitting around the dinner table with friends, you just have scriptures that come to your mind because you're always in the Word. Well, I had been an adherent to the doctrines of grace, commonly called Calvinism. And as everybody knows about Spurgeon, if you know him, he was an ardent five-point Calvinist. He, that's one of the things he never wavered on was the doctrines of grace. And many people know him as a pastor as well. He mainly pastored two congregations his entire life. Water Beach Chapel, which is where he pastored from about 16 to 19. And then he pastored from 19 up to his death at 57, the New Park Street slash Metropolitan Tabernacle. And it's not my goal here to give you a big overarching biography of Spurgeon, but Spurgeon is known primarily for those who know him as a pulpit pastor. And as I was going through my MDev, I went kind of a cage stage of open air preaching. I came out here, met Russ Robinson, John Tyre, Aaron Schaffer Wallace, and in 2014, and that sparked the love for this place that I never would imagine culminating into what it is now with such dear brothers. And I absolutely love it here. But as I was studying Spurgeon, I came across his lectures to my students. And if you know that book, those are his Friday evening lectures to his pastor's college students. He started many parachurch organizations, but one of the most famous is his college for pastors. And in his college for pastors, it was actually very hard to get into. You had to already be doing ministry. First off, he wanted to train rough and ready ministers that couldn't afford to go to the high classy schools of the established church, the Church of England. And in those Friday night lectures, if you read the lectures to my students, the tone of those lectures is very laid back compared to his sermons. And he has such things in there, various topics of past strong ministry, how to prepare a sermon, how to preach on the use of your voice so you don't use it. All kinds of really practical things. Not all of which I agree with, by the way. But with that said, there's two lectures devoted to open air preaching. And there's not very many other subjects in there where our brother Spurgeon has a two-part series. And as I started asking even Spurgeon scholars like Tom Nettles and Ray Rhodes, did they know much about open-air preaching? They said, not much. So I decided that I wanted to go do a Ph.D. in Spurgeon at Midwestern Seminary, Kansas City, and and I did that, and I actually wrote on his pedagogy and practice of open-air preaching. Pedagogy is a 
fancy five dollar word to simply say the art of teaching how to teach. So that is the impetus of my research is pedagogy and practice of open air preaching. And my thesis, what my dissertation was about, is essentially Spurgeon's open air preaching influenced his pulpit ministry, particularly in his calls at the end of his sermons, sometimes in the middle, mostly at the end, for both sinners and saints to come to Jesus afresh. And there are times in his pulpit sermons where he is very, very, very fiery, especially in the first six volumes called the New Park Street Pulpit. Those were his younger years from about 19 to 22-ish. And Stephen Lawson also says, if you want vintage Spurgeon, read those volumes because he's very fiery and he is very, very good. One of my favorite quotes, not my most favorite, but one of them, he said to his congregation, there is dust enough on some of your Bibles to spell out doom with your fingers. So that's the kind of young, on-fire preacher that Spurgeon was. And in the lectures to my students, in those two lectures, the first lecture deals with the history of open-air preaching that Spurgeon traced starting with the Old Testament and the Prophets he viewed that as a form of preaching through their prophesying. All the way up through Jesus' own ministry, you remember Mark 1.15, he was on a beach when he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's one example where he did that. And then he moves on to the apostles, and he traces through the book of Acts where the apostles did open their preaching. And then through the early church, and then the Middle Ages. And then what's really interesting to me is that he says before the Reformation, there were Catholic friars. I know that word Catholic can be dirty in uh, more Reformed circles, so just bear with me here. He said that there's Catholic friars that the world will never know about that preached the gospel in the open air. And he says that open air pre preaching is what really stoked the fires of the Reformation. So he believes it was already pre burning, if you will, before Luther got on the scene with the German Reformation. Now, there are historians that obviously wouldn't agree with that, but my job today is to tell you what Spurgeon said. You can disagree with him on subjects. I certainly do. But Spurgeon believed that open air preaching actually fueled the Reformation. And he traces open air preaching all the way up to his current day, which was the 19th century, the 1800s. And in so doing, when he gets closer to his own century, he talks about men in the 18th century that did open their preaching. A lot of them, which were good, old-fashioned Armenian Methodists that believed the gospel, and they would basically do circuit riding and preach. And he owes a lot of his own inspiration to men like them, and Presbyterians as well. So Spurgeon traces the history of open air preaching all the way way back to the Old Testament up through to his current day, the 19th century. And his whole argument for laying out the history of open-air preaching is to say we have biblical justification for it and the church all throughout the ages has heralded the gospel in the open air. So go out and do it. He, he would require his students to actually open-air preach. 
before he would ever give them a pulpit. In fact, he argues in one of the lectures that it's easier to make justification for open air preaching than pulpit preaching. He's like, you won't find very many people preaching inside of a building like this in the scriptures. Now, of course, we know that there was teaching happening in the synagogue. So there is that. But Spurgeon's big point is to say that in open air preaching, that's the biblical pattern you see more than anything else. So that is the first lecture where he argues we have a long historicity. It's steeped in biblical and church tradition of the best kind. So go out and do it. And in the second lecture, it's called Open Air Preaching Remarks Their Own. And it's just what it sounds like. The first lecture was pretty academic, pretty heavy, so it's one of those times where I said that his preachings and sermons on Friday nights were laid back, not that night, because he's quoting from a lot of sources. And you can really see where Spurgeon's knowledgeable in early church history and even history outside of his own strict Baptist Reformed 1689 tradition. So with that said, that second lecture, Remarks Their Own, is much more laid back because he's giving his students uh, practical hints on how to do open air preaching. Uh, one of the ones that I find most interesting, and if you read that lecture, it's like shotgun, shotgun, shotgun. It's not really a, a flow or a point. Uh, I really just think he's wing, winging it, just going off years of wisdom. One thing he says is like, if you open air preach and it's windy outside, don't fight against the wind. And, and he says things like, you, you, you want to speak clearly and boldly, but you don't want to yell at the top of your lungs. Uh, a lot of folks that go to the general convic con convention, or the general conference, rather, and they're out there screaming at the top of their lungs, calling precious LDS souls morons. They would do well to listen to that lecture and listen to it with open hearts. And if any of you guys do that, can I just take a moment to say here, repent. If in, if in your heart, when, when that precious LDS man was there, and your first instinct was anger towards him being there, and not compassion, search your heart. Spend time in the local church, healing, and doing business with God. Then get back out on the streets. Get back out in the field. You'll be a blessing to us all. So, and Spurgeon says stuff like that and remarks their own. It's like you want to be a compassionate preacher. He even uses language similar to the dirty word of winsome nowadays. If you look at social media. Because he tells people both in open air preaching and in pulpit preaching such things that a lot of committed five point Calvinists would have a lot of trouble with we're going to look at one later on in this lecture so in that remarks their own he gives a lot of practical hints so let me give you one more he says if you're going to open air preach place yourself in a spot where there's a wall behind your back. 19th century. People still hated the gospel back then. I hear a lot of older saints talk about the good old days. Well, the good old days won't come till Jesus comes back. Men have always hated the preaching of Christ. And that's something that he warns his students about. 
So he's like, protect yourself. Use common sense. Don't be an idiot and, and disguise that zeal or disguise that idiocy for zeal. That's essentially what he says. So you have in those two lectures just historicity and then practical remarks. And then what I want to spend the majority of my time on is my favorite Spurgeon sermon. And if you want to know this sermon, it's Numbers 39 and 40. So it was a double volume edition uh, back when they were printing the sermons. And it's called Heaven and Hell. Heaven and Hell. And as you can imagine, it's an open air sermon. And he writes about this in his four volume autobiography in two different places. And normally when I teach and preach, I don't mess with paper. It's just easier for me. But I wanted to quote Spurgeon at length in this lecture. And my memory is just not that good when it comes to quoting Spurgeon because he's very wordy. He's very good. So I have paper here that I'm going to be fiddling with, but I want you to hear Spurgeon. Uh, don't get distracted by the man with CP. Okay, so he writes about his own experience at this place. Many years ago, I preached to enormous assemblies in King's Edwards Road, Hackney, which was then open fields. On, these, on those occasions, the rush was perilous to life and limb, and there seemed no limit to the throngs. Half the number would have been safer. That open space has vanished, and it is the same with fields at Brixton, where in years gone by, it was delightful to see the assembled crowds listening to the word. Burdened with the rare trouble of drawing too many together, this is interesting, I have been compelled to abstain from these exercises in London, but not from any lessened sense of their importance. With the tabernacle always full, that's the Metropolitan Tabernacle, the big one that everybody thinks about now, I have as large a congregation as I desire at home and therefore do not preach outside except in the country. But for those ministers whose area under cover is but small and whose congregations are thin, the open air, listen to this, the open air is the remedy, whether in London or in provinces. So in that first block quotation, he mentions that he used to preach, and, but he says he doesn't anymore because by that time Spurgeon's popularity was so big they had to sell tickets in order to keep people out. And you may think that's weird. Why would you sell tickets to a church service? You, you've got to understand just how popular Spurgeon was. When Americans would visit, they were often asked two questions when they got back home. Did you see the queen? Did you hear Mr. Spurgeon preach? And we think John Piper's popular. Nobody cares about John Pop Piper out there in the world. But, dear ones, Spurgeon really was that popular. And you think about it in terms of a world without internet, a world without social media, a world without each other eating each other on Twitter. But Spurgeon was that popular that when he got established in the final building, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, he's like, it's a public safety hazard for me to preach because even in this sermon that he hearkens back to, he was 21 years old and people were lining up in that field to hear him preach. Listen to this quote. This is more extensively about the preachings in Hackney in this open field. For those of you that are interested in 
uh, the first quote was from the third volume of the autobiography. This is from the second. There were two evenings, June 22nd and September 4th, both in 1855, where Spurgeon says, I preached in the open air in a field in King Edwards Road, Hackney. On the first occasion, I had the largest congregation I had ever addressed up to that time. But at the next service, the crowd was still greater. By careful calculation, it was estimated that from 12 to 14,000 persons were present. 21-year-old boy. Right? 1855. So you do the math on when he was born. He was about 21. 12 to 14,000 people are lining up to listen to him open their preach. I think I shall never forget the impression I received before we separate, <coughs> before we separated that the vast multitude joined in singing Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That night, I could understand better than ever before why the Apostle John in the Revelation compared the new song in heaven to the voice of many waters. In that glorious hallelujah, the mighty waves of praise seemed to roll up towards the sky in majestic grandeur even as the billows of old ocean break upon the beach. So he says essentially, I'll never forget that night. And what we'll be looking at is that sermon, Heaven and Hell. Here's the text of that night that Spurgeon would never forget. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So you can see where he got his sermon title. Heaven, the children of Abraham sitting down, and then hell, the outer darkness, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And, and if that gentleman from the LDS church was still here, I, I would still say this. So when the scriptures talk about outer darkness, it's not the same thing that our LDS friends think of as outer darkness. And Spurgeon's going to elaborate on just how ba bad Hell is. But think about this 21-year-old boy starting out his sermon with these words. This is the September 4th sermon, Heaven and Hell. Tonight, I shall, I hope, encourage you to seek the road to heaven. I shall also have to utter some very sharp things concerning the end of the lost and the pit of hell. Upon both these subjects I will try and speak as God helps me, but I beseech you, <coughs> listen to his evangelism coming out here, but I beseech you, as you love your souls, weigh right and wrong this night, see whether what I say be the truth of God, if it be not, reject it utterly and cast it away. But if it is, at your peril, disregard it. For as you shall answer before God, the great judge of heaven and earth, it will go ill with you if the words of his servant and of his scripture be despised. You see Spurgeon's evangelistic heart even here coming out in the very opening He's saying, what I'm going to speak about is very serious. What I'm going to speak about deserves everyone's full attention. So listen to what I've got to say. But be warned, your soul hangs in the balance. That's essentially what he says. One of the reasons why I like this sermon is because it's so simple to follow. <coughs> 
He has two points. So some would say he's not a real Baptist. But he has two points. Y'all got that eventually. <laughs> uh, the first one being on heaven, and the second one being on hell. And listen to how he talks about heaven. Remember I told you that I disagree with my brother Spurgeon? Here's one of the areas where I disagree. And if you're a post-mill and theonomic here in the room, you're just going to have to get over this. You're going to get real excited about what Spurgeon's about to say. So put your seatbelt on and don't become Pentecostal as you listen to this. <laughs> so Spurgeon says talking about hell, or excuse me, talking about heaven. He says... <clears throat> see here. I confess I have no wish for a very small heaven. And I love to read in the scriptures that there are many mansions in my father's house. How often do I hear people say, Ah, straight is the gate and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. <coughs> there will be very few in heaven there will be most lost. My friend, I differ from you. Do you think that Christ will let the devil beat him? That he will let the devil have more in hell than there will be in heaven? No, it is impossible. For then Satan would laugh at Christ. There will be more in heaven than there will be among the lost. God says that there will be a number of that no man can number who will be saved. But he never says that there will be a number that no man can number that will be lost. There will be a host beyond all count who will get into heaven. What glad tidings for you and for me! For if there are so many to be saved, why should I not be saved? Why should not you? Why should not yon man over there in the crowd say, Cannot I, I be one among the multitudes? He would do that a lot, both in open air preaching and in the pulpit. Look people dead in the eye and start talking to them. So that's probably what he's doing here. That's actually how the Lord saved him through a blunt, primitive Methodist Arminian preacher. The, the man just looked at Spurgeon and said, Young man, you must obey my text. You look miserable. And it was at that moment that the scales fell from Spurgeon's eyes. So that primitive, in Spurgeon's words, stupid preacher. I didn't say that. He said that. I'm just quoting Spurgeon. He was a very unlearned man, a stupid man. God used him to convert the greatest Baptist preacher that the world has ever seen, in my, in my opinion even better than John MacArthur. So with that said, dear ones, he would often look at people in the crowd and ask them questions. And he goes on to say, and may not the poor woman there take heart and say, well, if there were but half a dozen saved, I might fear that I should not be one. But since many are to come, why should not I also be saved? Cheer up, disconsolate. Cheer up, son of mourning, child of sorrow. There is hope for thee still. I can never know that any man has passed God's grace. Think about that LDS soul that was in our midst. He's not past God's grace. There be a few that have sinned, that sin that is unto death, and God gives them up. But the vast host of mankind are yet within the reach of sovereign mercy, and many of them shall come from the east and from the west, and shall sit down in the kingdom of heaven. So you can definitely see his post mill like leanings, at least at this young age, where he honestly believed, because of the Calvinistic divine election that he cherished all throughout his ministry, at least at this point, he believed that because of the doctrine of election that God would elect 
more unto heaven than unto hell. I disagree with that. That's not the point of this lecture. I'm sure many of you do too. There's room to disagree with Brother Spurgeon. So, with that said, he goes on to talk about heaven in such glorious ways. And if I had more time, I could have pulled a couple more quotes out. But I want to honor the time of this conference, honor Brother Aaron. Go home and read that sermon. You can find it on the Midwestern Spurgeon Library website. They've digitized all of the big 63-volume set. Go home, look up heaven and hell, read it. It'll bless your soul the way he talks about heaven. And oh my, he had a way with the words and how he instilled hope in people. But you see, even in this kind of post mill, there's going to be more in heaven than in hell a diatribe he went upon. He's still using that theological view to push people towards the kingdom. Saying, come, come. There's going to be many in heaven. Join us. There's no reason for you to be a fool and to let your soul burn in an everlasting hell. That is essentially his argument for the first part of his sermon. And then he goes on to talk about to talk about the hell. And Spurgeon, when he talks about hell, he doesn't do so with glee. Like many street preachers I've seen do. None in this room. Let that be said. But I've seen street preachers glory in, in judgment. And that should not be our posture, brothers and sisters. And oftentimes in Spurgeon's sermons, he would, he would role play. He would, he would act as if he was a master or he would act as if he's a slave owner and bring on points to his sermons through that. He would act as if he's a son or act in the pulpit as if he's a father. And here is one of the most <coughs> bone-chilling examples of role-playing I've ever seen Spurgeon do. Um, <coughs> in talking about that day of judgment when all people are cast into the final hell, Spurgeon goes into role-playing. He says... That dreadful dream which a pious mother once had and told to her children. She thought the judgment day was come. The great books were opened. They all stood before God. You see what he's doing here? He's echoing Matthew 25. And Jesus Christ said, Separate the chaff from the wheat. <coughs> Put the goats on the left and the sheep on the on the right, the mother dreamed that she and her children were standing just in the middle of the great assembly. And the angel came and said, I must take the mother. She is a sheep. She must go to the right hand. The children are goats. They must go on the left. She thought as she went, her children clutched her and said, Mother, can we part? Must we be separated? She then put her arms around them and seemed to say, My children, I would, if possible, take you with me. But in a moment the angel touched her. Her cheeks were dry. And now, overcoming natural affection, being rendered supernatural and sublime, resigned to God's will, she said, My children, I taught you well. I trained you up and forsook the ways, and you forsook the ways of God. And now all I have to say is amen to your condemnation. <coughs> I've got something caught in my throat. <coughs> 
Yeah. So, amen to your condemnation. Spurgeon is not glorying in damnation in this text. But what he is doing is he's teaching those 12 to 14,000 people that there's a day coming even when those who love you most, if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ in this life, and might I say in our context, the biblical Lord Jesus Christ, there's coming a day when those who love you most on this earth will will recognize that it it is good and right because you've spurned the creator of the universe, because you've spurned Jesus Christ. Those who love you most, if you exit this life and go out into hell, they'll recognize that you deserve to be there. And in a sense, you chose to be there of your own wills. Time after time you've sat through teaching and you've sat through sermons and you've heard the gospel preached to you and you rejected it. There's a day coming when all the evil that you've brought upon the gospel by not receiving it personally and really into your own heart. Spurgeon is saying, dear ones, that on that day, nothing that is good in creation will object to you being sent to hell. And I think there's warrant to say that all of creation is going to say amen to your condemnation. We will one day rejoice, not in the damnation of sinners, but we will rejoice in God's beautiful justice because in the damning of sinners, both human and angelic, there will be no more sin. We will have our sin wiped away clean by the blood of Christ and heaven being given that righteousness of God. We won't have to deal with sin because Jesus paid it all. But the rest of humanity that didn't want Jesus, they'll, they'll begin their eternal debt payment. And it'll be a hundred thousand times worse than the worst student loan you've ever heard about. And there will be nobody even fainting to come forgive you of your debt. That is what Spurgeon is getting at in this text. And and he ends it, the sermon, this way. And I told you that some of his rhetoric would would make a fine, fire-breathing Calvinist wince and grimace. Listen to this. He's gone through heaven and hell. And listen to his appeal to these twelve to 14,000 people. 21-year-old boy, keep that in mind. He still had a lot to learn. And now, thou chief of sinners, list one moment while I call thee to Jesus. By the way, when he's using King James language, that's actually how they talked back then. It wasn't how our LDS friends weirdly talk in that language Uh, but it was the lingua franca of the day if you will oh that will be good for the video (laughs) so yeah if you haven't figured out I love to make fun of myself and and, uh, my precious church family does everything they can to cultivate (laughs) dead so I, I love my church family if you're in Provo and you're not a part of a local church, may I suggest this is a fine one to be at. You know, uh, you, you get to hear good preaching, good worship through music, good worship through preaching. And we love LDS people here, but we love them enough to tell them similar things to what Brother Aaron said. They don't think we love them oftentimes, but man, we do. So be a part of a local church so you can laugh at things like what just happened. So, with that said, this is Spurgeon, and he says here, I'll just start over, and now, thou chief of sinners, list one moment while I call thee to Jesus. There is one person here tonight who thinks himself the worst that ever lived. There is one who says to himself, I do not deserve to be called to Christ. I am sure 
So I call thee, thou lost, most wretched outcast, this night by authority given me of God, I call thee to come to my Savior. Some time ago, when I went into the county court to see what they were doing, I heard a man's name called out. And immediately the man said, Make way, make way, make way. They call me. And up he came. Now I call thee, the chief of sinners, tonight. And let him say, Make way, make way, doubts. Make way, fears. Make way, sins. Christ calls me. And if Christ calls me, that is enough. Go and try, my Savior. Go and try, my Savior. If He cast you away after you sought Him, tell in the pit that Christ would not hear you. But, but that you shall never be allowed to do if you dishonor the mercy of the covenant for God to cast away one penitent sinner. And it shall never be while it is written. Many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom. What do you think about the language of go and try? A, a, a lot of Calvinists uh, would shirk back at that language. I know the vast majority of us in here are Calvinistic, so that's why I'm making that general assumption. If you're not, that's fine. It's not that big a deal in the eternity, I don't think. But with that said, what do you think about the language of go and try? Spurgeon is so evangelistic. He is willing to use every opportunity, every nuance his 21-year-old brain could think of to make Jesus look beautiful and attractive and appealing. And I'm using all those words in the best of senses because, dear ones, our Lord is the King of beauty. Uh, our Lord is the one that even though He will one day come back in wrath and judge all of humanity, He is the one who at His own core, in His heart, in His humanity, He is gentle and lowly in heart. And He beckons all sinners to come unto Him. Not in the weird, culty way that we hear so much around here, but to come unto Him, meaning that you trust in Him and Him alone. You don't trust in supposed temple worthiness. You don't trust in the fact that your so-called bishop gives you a, a temple recommend card. You don't trust in the fact that you keep the Ten Commandments. But you trust in the Jesus revealed only in the Scriptures. And you fly to Him. And, and you try Him. You taste and see that the Lord is good. And oh, how sweet He is. <coughs> So if I can circle back around to the text by which I opened up. Paul said this in context to Timothy, who was a pastor, but it really applies to all preachers and teachers and ministers of the Word. I solemnly charge you before God in Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead. You see that eternal perspective. He's got an end times perspective. Paul is saying, there's a judgment day coming. So what I'm about to charge you with, give you authority to do, you take it seriously. And he says, preach the word. And that word preach there, that verb, the tense of it is very nuanced in Greek. And it basically has this idea of Keep on preaching the Word. Don't stop. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't give up, Timothy. You're doing good work. Keep on doing it. That's what the idea is there. He says in our English Bibles, preach the Word. Right? Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch.
itch to hear what they want to hear. Hello? Sounds, sounds like where we live, doesn't it? Sounds like recent capitulations of the major so-called church here, doesn't it? The Word of God is relevant, folks. I know I'm preaching to the choir quite literally in every sense of that word. <laughs> I, I want you to know, don't grow weary in doing good. <coughs> Those of you women who are, who are mostly how Swiles. You are some of the greatest evangelists we have because you're raising up young ones. You're a preacher and a teacher, not in the pastoral sense, so don't go, come out of here thinking I'm egalitarian, but you are preaching and teaching to your young ones. Don't grow weary in doing good. For those of you that hand out tracts, don't grow weary in doing good. But I want to say this. I know I'm talking to a bunch of preachers in, in the room. Don't grow weary in doing the best good. And that is by being a covenant member of your local church. And I would go so far to say, dear ones, if you are not a covenant member of a local church and being under the authority of your pastors where they can discipline you and keep you in control, Listen to me, I say this with all love. You have no business being out on the streets. Spurgeon would have told you that. He had a high view of membership. And by the way, I'm so thankful that many of you are from local churches and you love your local churches. Don't grow weary in doing good. When you go out on the streets to evangelize, rep your church. Say, you know, I'm from the Mission Church. I'm from First Baptist Provo. I'm from, I forgot the rest of y'all's churches. I'm sorry. <laughs> but with that said, don't be embarrassed by your local church. Witness to people and then invite them to come to church. Encourage your pastors by letting them see the tangible fruit of your ministry. Because that keeps them doing good as well. And we want to see evangelism get the glory it deserves because Paul tells Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Isn't it a joy to be here and be on mission? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for these dear brothers and sisters. I pray that they would be churchmen first, evangelists second, and that they would love their local churches in their ministries. And I pray, ask that you would keep us all in, in the fight. Ask Paul told Timothy later on, Paul has fought the good fight of faith. And may every person here who's truly yours be able to write down words to some new Timothy one day like that. that they're passing on that torch. And a million years from now, we're going to be able to look back on our earthly lives and see just everything that was done for, by, and to your glory through pitiful sinners like us. We thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. May we live and die by that profession of faith. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.